Have you heard about Global Poker? Global Poker is the fastest growing card room in the US today, and it's available online at globalpoker.com. Global Poker is a social poker site that offers safe and secure cash out options by using their unique and patented sweepstakes model. Players can compete in big guaranteed tournaments, jackpot sit and goes, or cash games featuring Hold'em, Omaha, and even Crazy Pineapple. Don't wait. Check out Global Poker today. Poker Stories is an audio series that features casual interviews with some of the game's best players and personalities. Each episode highlights a well-known figure in the poker world and dives deep into their favorite tales both on and off the felt. Hello and welcome to Poker Stories, a podcast brought to you by Card Player, the Poker Authority, and hosted by me, Julio Rodriguez. This is episode number 63, and I can promise you it's a great one. This episode features Lane Flack, known to a lot of poker fans as Back to Back Flack. Now, a common misconception is that he earned that nickname after back to back bracelet wins in both 2002 and 2003. But the truth is, and you'll hear this in the podcast, that Lane got that nickname earlier in his career. Lane, uh, who is about to turn 50, has six World Series of Poker bracelets in total, which puts him in a tie for number nine all time with guys like Daniel Negreanu, uh, TJ Cloutier, Jay Heimowitz, Jeff Lissandro, and Ted Forrest. But it's not Lane's poker skill that makes him such a great interview. Uh, the guy is just a natural born storyteller, and he's just so happened to have lived a life full of insane stories. There are so many good ones in this episode, and I still have no doubt that he could fill another hour with more. I'm not going to spoil anything, I'll just get right into the podcast. Enough intro. Here's my conversation with Lane Flack. You want me to sing? Do you have a good voice? No, but I watch American Idol <laughs> and the voice, and I love it, and I swear to God. I swear to God, I think if if anybody practices like their favorite song, Mm -hmm. they could pass stage one. You think so, but people aren't realistic about their abilities. Mostly because they're nervous. I don't know. And they're nervous and they shake. But think about the best song you know you sing in the car. Yeah. Or you sing in the shower. or The song I've sung a hundred times. Right. So if you put some work (laughs) into that song, you you could probably pass. You could get the audition. What's your song? I don't know. I was trying to think about it. I guess I'm good on it. It has to have no outlier notes, right? R- right. You yeah. you don't have to show off. Yeah. Yeah. You don't have to. You don't have to. <laughs> no reason to challenge yourself. Right, I don't know because right, right. I, I I listened. To, I I used to be an American Idol fan. I remember when William Hung was there before he got into poker, and he. There's no way anybody told that guy before he auditioned, you suck. That, that was a shebang guy, right? Yeah. You, yeah. She bangs. She bangs. She bangs. She but there's a lot of people on that show who you go up and you go, how did nobody, how did your mom right. not tell you you suck? You know what I mean? How did that not come up ever? No one told you the truth your well, whole he, life? Well, he possibly never even told his parents he's going to. Right. Like, in our world, that's like, what, did you lose a bet? <laughs> you, you know? I have a photo with William Hung at the Venetian. You did, that's awesome. Yeah, he was just sitting there playing cash one day, so. Man, I, 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 you would want to sit down in the game with him just to see how, how he is. It was a 1-2, I think he was playing 1-2 PLO, believe it or not. Oh, really? All right, but... Uh, yeah, you, you wonder if that's his true character. <laughs> you know? Yeah, or, oh, yeah, yeah. Or if it was a show. He didn't seem like no, that... Didn't foreign touristy out of it when I was seeing him at the Venetian. But that was months later, so who knows? Right. I'll bet he got humbled in, in popularity of some sort and started acting differently. I bet that guy still can't go anywhere without people recognizing him, though. I, I wouldn't recognize him, but I, I, I had yeah, but you just I did, I one look a day. for 10, 12 years. Yeah. What about you? How's, how is poker popularity these days? By the way, we started, by the way. I don't yeah, it's fine. Uh, <laughs> uh, the popularity of poker, well, it's... Do you get stopped on the street by people who are like, that's that's Lane Flack? Yeah. But it's to the point now a lot because it's once I say I'm in poker, mm-hmm. then it dawns on them. Oh, you're that one. Yeah. Because yeah, yeah. I'm always wearing a hat mm-hmm. and I'm always, I never shave and my hair is long or whatever. And when, when they hear my name, they're like, I, yeah, I know, I know. But other than that, it's not always like, ah, oh, there he is. Unless I'm in the casino area. Oh, yeah. Then, of in course, casino, it makes sense you know, to spy, yeah. yeah. Uh, let's go back to the beginning, May 18th, 1969. Rapid, what a year. 
Right, what a year, right? What a year. <laughs> the summer of 69. They wrote That's a whole right. song about it. Ryan right? Adams. <laughs> <laughs> Rapid City, South Dakota. Uh, what do you remember about your early days? My birth was Rapid City, South Dakota. I only lived there for a year. I know. You grew up in Montana, yeah. right? So I moved to Montana. I had a tough high school uh, uh, life because I moved to Montana, and after my sophomore year, we moved back to South Dakota, mm-hmm. and then only for three or four months. Back to Montana. Oh, wow. Then two places in Montana, then back to South Dakota. That's a lot of uprooting. And then finally, my that was just my junior year. My senior year, my <laughs> parents had to move again. I said, no, I'm staying. So I, I lived with my brother for my senior year. But I didn't you know, have that connection with like you do in high school. What was your what were your interests back then? Um, I don't, what does one even get into it in Montana? <laughs> you know, I, cars. Yeah, cars, okay. Yeah. Cars. I, I mean, I went to college, but it, cars. We didn't have poker. We didn't have gambling then, and it was they had poke, uh, what do you call those things, keno machines and stuff. Mm-hmm. But Deadwood, South Dakota, opened up when I was in college. That's how I got into it. I came home on my on my summer breaks and started. In well, we'll get there. We'll get there. I want to get there. But like well, you mentioned, cars like uh, like to go fast, to look good. What, what were I, you into? You know, I guess everybody instead they of buying cars. They used to call cars, you uh, Cadillac Flack, right? I think David Oppenheim called me Cadillac <laughs> Flack. He liked that Cadillac, but I drove a Cadillac. Yeah, I love that car, but. Nobody, when you're kids, it wasn't new cars there. It was like my, I had a 78 Z, 1978 Z28 Camaro. Okay. That canary yellow. License plates are STBN, CBN. So that can't, that couldn't have been more than what, seven years old? Hold eight on. Eight years old when you, you had it? I got it in 80, it was 11 years old, completely redone. Yeah. You, you miss it though. You, what was, uh, tell me those license plate numbers again. STBN, CBN. <laughs> Stabbing cabin. Cabin. <laughs> the that's, stabbing that's stupid, that's cabin. A, that's the stupid stuff you do when you're a kid, right? <laughs> I, I don't even know. I don't even know where it came from. <laughs> that license plate went right over my head, that vanity number. Yeah. Uh, okay, so you're 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 uh, playing with cars, and then the, what was it, the University of South Dakota comes calling? Well, I, I had moved back to Montana, but uh, I went back to South Dakota, decided to go to college when mm-hmm. I was like 20, and I, and I only went for a couple years. Because uh, <laughs> I had a couple wealthy roommates, and they weren't very good at cards. <laughs> they they kind of forced your hand. So all we did was play cards. And well, play. what were you pretending to study in your, in your time? <laughs> well, over? I did study. It was, <laughs> it was business economics and psychology. Okay. But I uh, and then I, you come home, and I and my parents' ranch was right by Deadwood, South Dakota. So mm-hmm. I got into poker, and I I knew where I was. I knew that was it. But you had played cards before then, right? Sure, like uh, sure, sure. family games, pinochle, that kind of stuff? I played pinochle, pitch, spades, cribbage, all at the age five, six years old. Okay. This was a grandparents thing or you know, dad? My or? parents had card game, uh, you know, stuff all the time. I, I played a lot of cribbage with my father, but uh, we played mostly pinochle. <clears throat> and uh, we, we, did you have a knack for it early on or did you discover? I was certainly intrigued. I started liking things that you could you could never gauge how good you are. Okay. <laughs> Does that make sense? Say you're a bowler and you bowl a 300 game. Mm-hmm. That's the best you can do. Where's the limit? That's true. You know, in and, and this, you, how do you, you just keep going. You know, you can't make enough. <laughs> yeah, you can't, roll, you can't play a perfect game of poker. Right. <laughs> Even if you win. You win all the money and still make mistakes. But I, uh, you know, I started getting cool nicknames. Diamond in the Rough, Boy Genius, because I was doing stuff that, Maybe I was just in where I was the youngest in. This was you as a player or working in the casino? Player. Okay, yeah. Yeah. I mean, in Deadwood, I won all the tournaments. Every time there was tournaments around, I won them. The same in Billings, Montana. I won everything. Mm-hmm. But I, I, you know, I had a little more aggressive style, and the era of people then weren't aggressive. What kind of games were you playing back then? <laughs> Montana was unique. Both these places were unique. Montana, you couldn't have a pot higher than $300. Oh, the cap. So, so you would play ten twenty, because if you had a five way pot, you couldn't have more than sixty dollars in the pot, and because all betting cuts off, turn your hands over. Oh, it's not even three hundred per person. It's... No, pot cannot exceed more yeah. than three hundred dollars. <laughs> you know, with a couple hours left in the night, it's, you know, it's flips. Yeah, you know, six of us. You know, you're you're, you're putting fifty bucks, and just keep going. You know, for a couple hours. So it wasn't even poker, and Deadwood was you could play. Deadwood is different. You can play whatever limits you wanted, but it couldn't exceed $100. Not oh, okay. the pot, but the bet. Got it. 
So the biggest games. So it was like a spread limit game almost. Yeah. And it was hundred bucks at a time, you know. So it was, we played one to five, Omaha high low. But I mean, I went down to audition to deal. And the first hand I dealt, there was five side pots. And oh I never, wow! And I, I was working at a casino as a busboy because I wasn't twenty one. And then I was playing in, in a game down here, and when the guy that ran that game walked in the door and seen me sitting at a poker table where I was the dealer <laughs> at a new casino, he goes, oh, you're a dealer? I says, sure. Never dealt a uh, hand in my life. He says, well, come down and audition. First hand, five side pots, $600 in a pot, all $1 chips. And I'm like, you're doing all this complex yeah, math. I, I, and, and, <laughs> and I did it with ease. Like yeah. all the side pots and everybody's questioning, it was spot on. They said, done, you're hired. Right, so you were playing at one casino at night while you were working as a busboy at the other one. But but a busboy for like 30 days. It was, mm -hmm. yeah. The guy spots you and says, hey, you can yeah. pick your cards. Yeah. How long did you did you last in the box? Because I read you were running rooms after a while, right? Yeah, so I met a girl, the mother of my child, and we moved to, back to Billings, Montana, where I mm -hmm. knew I could run my own games. Is it right? No, yeah, you're good. I'm just making sure. <laughs> Look at me like that. Run my own games and stuff. Uh, and that got tiring. Can you imagine being 21, 22 and dealing games seven days a week from six till two in the morning? Yeah, I can imagine. In, in, a, in one of the pop, you know, popular bars, <laughs> all the fun's going on. I'm down here. Going, Was this before or after Reno? Before. Okay. So what happened was my girlfriend got offered a job to like deal the Peppermill tournament. And I'd never been out of the state, really. I Between Montana and South Dakota. So we went down there and she dealt and I won a tournament. I don't know, 15,000 or something. It was nothing. Yeah. I became a player. <laughs> she became a worker. <laughs> Somebody at the table, I remember, it's so funny, this older gentleman says, so my girlfriend's dealing and I play, and she goes, well, what happens if you go broke? The guy at the table says, she can get two jobs. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Does she have to? Does that happen? Uh, so wait, you, you're in Reno, you do well. Uh, she's got the job. The two of you move back to... Uh, no. So we lived there for about a year. I, I actually came down and and, uh, and uh, did a card player cruise, and she dealt it, and I played then. Mm -hmm. I might have dealt for maybe two or three days. I, it just wasn't for me. I, I'd rather play. And uh, as long as she'll work, I'll play. What did you What did you find the problem was? The, just the boredom, or were you, like, seeing how soft the players were and itching to get in? Or I got in a lot of trouble when I dealt. Because I'd call their hands before they turn them over. Yeah. You know, and they're like, they would think I was cheating as the dealer, like a 10 20 game or something. I'm like, turn over, Ace Jack. What you? And yeah, he hadn't yeah. turned his hand over yet. Yeah. Exactly. You know, it's like I knew what he had. So there was like, what's going on here? So they figured I was playing, all poker dealers played, but I just rose up quick. Mm -hmm. So I knew that was probably better to do. All right. So you got into the game. Uh,. Is that when you met Huck? No. Um, was it 94? I went... See, that's why that stuff's a little off. Yeah. I, I actually came to the World Series in 94 to deal it. Oh, okay. And with my girlfriend. She ended up dealing the whole thing. I made it a week. <laughs> and when we was on the cruise, I had met a guy on there that... I didn't know anything about staking people or stuff like that. He says, you know, if you're going to be at the World Series, I, I like you to play a few satellites. Well, I played three of them and won all three. <laughs> so that was my initiation into the World Series. And I didn't have to. I did pretty well, so I didn't, I didn't really have to, have to work. And then that was in 94, 95. I, well, I went back and had my own poker games in a place called Bozeman, Montana. Okay. I came home one day, and my house is, is cleaned out. My, my girlfriend and daughter are gone. And a note says, work is more important to you than family. Mm. I'm like... Dodge that bullet, off she went, right? I wish I had my daughter back, which, she, by the way, she just left yesterday. It was her birthday. Happy and, birthday. Uh, and, uh, she, and then I, I, we, with a partner, I had games in Billings, Bozeman, and Missoula. Mm -hmm. In Missoula, Huck's brother lived. Uh, he was going to school there. And he, after he won the World Series in 96, he came up there to visit his brother. And we're just playing in the game together. And oh, cool. We're chatting. And he, and he just, it's all he said was, the way you play, you should be in Vegas. Well, me and the guy that runs the game, my partner, I started dating another girl who was in the business. We just went to, went to Vegas out as a vacation. Okay. In uh, August of 97 for the Hall of Fame, and I won it. 
This is, yeah, the, the Hall of Fame tournament. Yeah, that's the first time I came to Vegas. So I, I, I took $2,000. I lost it. I wired home for another 1000 <laughs> I won a satellite, and I won the tournament. So I went home. It was like 78000 which still is a lot. I went home. By January, I was ba- basically broke. <laughs> you lost I, it all. No, I helped everybody. Oh, you, you know, were the new winner. Right. New winner syndrome. Help me. To, you know, everybody's in trouble. I'm helping everybody. After yeah. the first big score, everyone comes yeah. out of the woodwork from the I rail. I didn't go completely broke, but I, now, and I, and I, <laughs> this is funny. Uh, Omaha, I lose my game. There's a 300, after the Hall of Fame, uh, there's a 300, 600 Omaha, I lose game. Mm-hmm. So I says, let's go. Where is was it, this running at? Is it the horseshoe. Okay. It was me, Johnny Chan, Dave Devilfish, and Sam Grizzle. <laughs> I beat him out of 30,000. Oh, you were the young gun at the table. Oh, yeah. I beat him out of 30,000. I had my girlfriend call down and page me so I could leave the game without telling girlfriend. Oh, you didn't want to hit and run? Yeah. <laughs> and I played quite a while. To win 30,000 in that game against those guys, you... <laughs> that's about to say. That's a lot of bets. Yeah. So, it was 50 <laughs> bets, right? So, I uh, I got out of that game. It was 30,000 sitting in front of you. She, she just fakes an emergency. Lane, you got to come quick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got to go. Guys. Can't possibly play another hand. So I learned early how to get out of the game. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that was kind of the start of your Vegas yeah. career, right? I, yeah. I, obviously, you won a tournament that first month you were here, it looks like, at the yep. Carnival of Poker. Yeah, the real. For another 65,000. Like 16 players left. I busted 14 of them. Whoa. One, one guy busted another one, and obviously I was the other player. So I busted 14 out of 15 of the last players. That is quite a run. Yeah, I've seen was. some. I've seen some like dominating finishes to a tournament before, uh, but yeah, that one would definitely be up there. <laughs> I, I got another one for you. This is you know I've hit the final table of the World Series with fifty percent of the chips, twice. Mm-hmm. The the WPT had seventy six percent of the chips. You come in with with stacks. Oh yeah, I don't know. It's just e- either you come all in or, nothing, or don't come in at all. <laughs> I remember Matt Savage calling, going, "We're going to go to uh, Monte Carlo." I says, all right. He says, but we're going to run the tournament this way. We're going to do it. It's a 15,000 buy-in. We're going to take 1,000 of that 15 and do an alternate tournament. For everybody who got knocked out, they can play for that. And the person who wins that gets to go back to the final table of the main tournament. Whoa. That was one theory or the other theory. I said, that's ridiculous. I said, once you're knocked out, yeah. you cannot come back in. It's unfair. <laughs> He says, you're right, TV's trying to do it this. I says, it's ridiculous. Don't do it. They didn't do it. I won the alternate tournament. <laughs> you won the alternate tournament. Yeah, so I got the 40000 or something instead of getting back in the thing, which you would go to the final table with whatever de- chips we decided. And that was an amazing tournament because with six people left, I was not chip leader at the beginning. And when I got head up, I wasn't chip leader. And I won that tournament 36 hands, 23 minutes, something like that. 30, 36 minutes, 23 hands. That's a swingy final table yeah i mean i just destroyed it <laughs> it was amazing it was wow I'm, i've had matt on the podcast before but that one might go down as one of his uh, weaker ideas <laughs> yeah <laughs> out there uh, and, 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 and he and he went my way because i and then i, I know, ended up winning yeah. and I, I stepped on my own foot you shot yourself in the foot there yeah. uh okay so you know in those early days in uh in Vegas, were you, you know, sticking with tournaments or was it cash games? Was it anything? I know Johnny Chan was kind yeah, of yeah. your guy back then. I'll explain. So when I got, come back in January of 98, mm-hmm. like I said, I was basically broke. Johnny Chan kept saying to me, kid, call me. Give me a call. Give me a call. The way you play, like. So he put me in a tournament, the mm-hmm. World Series. You're going to love this story, too. I, some of this stuff is just nuts, and it's true. It's not exaggerated. He come walking by me. He put me in, I think it was a 3,000 no limit. He got knocked out, and he come walking by me as my table, my hand is tabled. It's aces against ace, king, all in. Mm-hmm. Flop comes 10, jack, queen. He shakes his head, walks away. I feel horrible. I disappointed Johnny Chan. Well, when he gets done, I have $600 in chips. Oh, I think we're at the 5,100 level or so. I don't know what it was, 75, 151, I don't know what it was. But I looked down, I have two sevens. You stick in the 600, right? No, yeah. no, I made it 300 to go. I, Vince, God, you probably, you Bergio? Remember? Vince Bergio re-raises directly to my left. <laughs> I, I, I threw the two sevens away for $300. Whoa. I went to final table. It was 50. a different time. <laughs> I went to the final table, 50% of the chips. He come back in and said, what are you doing? How, how? <laughs> and he, he and he just watched for mm-hmm. mesmerized for hours, going, 
I, you'd, you'd never seen anything like it. So he says, I'm going to put you in this cash game. Go play Min the Master head up. I beat him out of 125 bets head up. <laughs> play one, 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 150, 300. I mean, like 35,000 or so. I don't know what it was. It was He's like, kid, we're going places. <laughs> was there anything that you wouldn't play back then? Or were you just like, whatever is, wherever there's action? Yeah. I mean, I picked up on the games pretty quick because of the card knowledge. I mean, I remember Johnny calling me one time. I was dead asleep and can't think of the guy's name from Scottsdale, Arizona. He drinks a ton. Do you know who I'm talking about? Ooh. Little ball player. I don't know what if I name names. <laughs> he's he's, he's old, an older Arab. God, I love the guy, too. Mark? No. But uh, he called, Johnny calls him like 3 in the morning and says, get up and get down here. He's drunk and he's playing ace to five low ball. Yeah. I says, let's go. How do you play? Yeah. <laughs> and But it, it's not hard to figure out. Draw and just try to get one, two, three, four, five. <laughs> Guy's drunk. He's going to give it away. Yeah, you make it sound so simple. All you got to do is hey, just get the, get the wheel. No big deal. I mean, as far as the explanation of the game. Yeah. It wasn't complex. I read, uh, you said in another interview that you almost play better on other people's money versus your own because of the pressure to come through. Well, it's not the pressure to come through. They scooped me up early. Like mm-hmm. Chan got a hold of me, then Ted Forrest got me, and I jumped right into the. I was playing in the Larry Flint game for a couple of years, but I noticed I have more drive or more care about other people's money than I do my own. Mm-hmm. At that, time, I was just a kid. I mean, I didn't care what I did with it. We'll yeah. make more. But if I was using somebody else's, it, it, now your reputation's on yes. the line. You know. Well, sure. Now, you know, it's, you're doing it for them now, and you're you're being judged and watched, so you stay in, in check. Granted, if Ted listens to this, he'd laugh at it because some of the stuff I've done with his money. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, like, uh, you know, what What did you feel like in, in those days uh, as, as far as your career was progressing? Did you think, I could do this for life or I'll do this for a little while, get in, make my money and get out? Like, no, what no, was I your had, thought process? I had no intentions of ever quitting. Uh, it was too easy. Mm-hmm. But, you know, for a decade, I was unstoppable. I mean, I, I I think I looked at it one time. I think I won 20-some events in a three- to four-year span. The late 90s, early 2000s kind of? 99 to 03, end of 03. Mm-hmm. I mean, I won five bracelets. Well, let's let's uh, let's uh let's mention them. The first one was 99, 3K, pot limit, hold them for 224 grand. How does that change your life? Does it? Yeah. Uh, I didn't know what to do with the money. You know, granted, I only got half, but, I mean, still, a hundred and some thousand, I, I didn't even know where to put it. Yeah. You know, so, we gambled. We played. <laughs> what did it, what did it mean being a bracelet winner in 1999? Did anybody care back then? Or? Oh, it was big. Bra- okay. Uh, having a, getting a bracelet then was everything. Mm-hmm. Now it's winning the main event, but, yeah, I don't know. I guess the younger kids that come out, probably, it's probably still just the bracelet. Well, for them, anybody who doesn't have one right. wants one. It's, it's you know? a bracelet, for sure. Yeah. But, I, got a, I got a new goal now. The, you know, the, the the prevailing thought, you know, before the poker boom was, you, you talk to a guy like Doyle, he says, well, we didn't even care about bracelets back in the day, and it was only Phil Helmuth who cared about, you know, racking them up. Well, I'm good friends with Phil, and I, I, I call him a liar. <laughs> if, if you're telling me it's not about the money and only about the accolade, you're trying to come across as humble as you can, and I call bull. It's always about the money. <laughs> Money. You're telling me, <laughs> you're telling me, if somebody said, you can have the bracelet, you got to give the money back, you would still sign up for that tournament? Of course not. That's right. But Phil would. Phil would. Apparently. I don't care about the money. In fact, I shouldn't even have to pay the entry fee because I'm only paying for the jewelry. <laughs> yeah, you keep the prize flow. Yeah. I'll just free roll yeah. this bracelet. Yeah, right. Uh, you know, moving on to 2002, 2003, you win back-to-back events at the series both years, add another almost, you know, million dollars in combined cashes there. But that wasn't why people started calling you back-to-back flack, right? So when did that come about, and uh, who do you credit for that one? 99 at the uh, Bicycle, the Legends. Okay. I won back-to-back days, and on day three, I uh, took fourth. Okay. I got a hold of two aces against Miami John. He snapped me off, or I uh, probably would have went. And that was back to back to back flat. Yeah, that would have been. That was a hold 'em, a stud, and a no limit hold hold 'em. Was it? I know one was stud. Whatever it was. Omaha, maybe. Yeah, maybe. But that was consecutive days. At the World Series in '02, it was back to back no limits, so they were like seven days apart. 
Right, right. So, so, was, but they still said back to back because it was just back to back. You no. can't possibly play both events back to back, at least not anymore. But I did. So that was the no limit, and then whenever the next no limit was, I won it. The next year, I won back to back days. I hadn't even went to sleep. You didn't go to sleep between no, I bracelets. I, back, back when I was, I, I, yeah, I hadn't been to bed yet. This was uh, uh, a chemical fueled uh, session, I'm assuming. Yeah, a what? A chemical fueled session. Possibly. <laughs> you had a little uh, go juice. I can't imagine. You win a bracelet, you you buy into an event, you play straight through, don't go to sleep, and then you win another one. How 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 many uh, of those type of uh, all nighter runs were you getting into back then? Were you notorious for this? No. I would rather say it off the record. Okay. But well, we have people who talk about you know Phil Locke's Iron Man Guinness record. Well, here, here's what happened, and I, and I don't want to mention names, but they are all poker players. I, I I never did drugs. Somebody got me to do an ecstasy pill. I was 31 years old. Right. I was hearing that you were pretty straight laced growing yes, up. Yes, and I, I touched nothing. And now, well, here's a guy who who ain't afraid to talk about it. But Mike Matisal got me to do in Memphis, Tennessee, crystal meth because it was the wonder drug for poker. They were sitting there for three or four days and just laser focused. Yeah. I said, I'll try it. And, but I knew nothing about it. I do now. You know, yeah. I get it now. But uh, Well, how many of you was even quoted as saying that uh, you played better on a little under the influence? Well, that's uh, just alcohol when he was saying that. Just the drinking, yeah. Well, he see, I, I lived, when I split up with my girlfriend, I lived at Ted Forrest's house, and Phil stayed there when he came in. So okay. this is the story he's referencing. At noon, they found me at, <laughs> at the strip club from the night before. And they said, what are you doing? I said, they came last night. They'll come again tonight, you know. <laughs> Ted's like, you, you know you're already bought into the tournament. I said, well, let's go. You know, I had it down. Lo and behold, he drew the seat right next to me, right? And he staked me. And I mean, I am hammered. Oh, I mean, annihilated. He says, dude, you, you look like shit. What are you going to do? I says, well, I ordered two more beers. <laughs> He's looking at Double me like, down. He's like, well, Ted's like, what, what did I get myself into, right? Well, he came back 13, 14 hours later, and I had every chip in the tournament. There you go. Right? And Hel- we're down like two tables, and Helmuth and the table, they literally let somebody sit to the right of me and somebody to the left of me. One to help me stack and one to make sure I didn't fall off the chair. <laughs> and one... Hand, oh, Jesus, I, I see, you know. that's all good. You want you want to take a break and take so that. no, I don't. So <laughs> what happened? One hand with Helmuth? No, I can't remember who it was, but a guy raised, and I and, and I and they think I'm tanking, and I'm thinking what I'm doing. Well, the truth oh, yeah, is, yeah. I fell asleep. <laughs> you know, I had my head down. I'm thinking I was dead asleep. Woke up and I just shoved in a bunch of money. Right. The guy looked at me, looked at me, looked at me, and goes, Holly Water, threw two jacks away. I turned over the eight dukes. <laughs> I had no clue what I was. Yeah. And, and Helm is like, I, there's nobody more dangerous. Yeah. What, what are you going to do? He's going to call you or raise you. <laughs> so, yeah, the exact quote from Helmuth is, uh, he's not scared of anyone in the world at No Limit Hold'em, but he has a healthy respect for Drunk Lane. So, <laughs> that's a great quote. I was like, Drunk I, Lane. <laughs> I, people say, why do you drink when you play? So I, I played more hands of poker drinking than I have sober, I guess. I don't know. In Montana, you know, that's all we did was, was drink. But now it's obviously different. Well, it's funny because uh, you mentioned somebody handed you a pill, and that's how you, Helmuth claims that, he, you know, you got into drugs in Amsterdam between poker stops on a trip. No, I didn't been to Amsterdam yet. <laughs> <laughs> but I, 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 I did go to Amsterdam four times after that. Yeah. But he Helmut doesn't know. He he's guessing, I'm sure. Um and the person that got me to do the ecstasy pill was somebody I trusted greatly. And it was crazy because we drove up to Beale Street, everybody's out having fun and I'm overshooting a game of pool by myself. And they're like, What are you doing? I says, Well, you guys gave me a drug and I figure if I can shoot this game of pool, I'm okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I was telling myself. If I'm able to do this, then I'm not messed up. Because I didn't never took a drug before, so I didn't know what it was gonna do to me. It's a pretty interesting way to keep yourself grounded. And yeah. Normal. I mean, I, they're like, oh, it hit you in a half hour. So I'm sitting here basically shaking, not knowing what's going to hit me. Yeah. <laughs> and then after it hit, I was like, I can't believe the whole world's not on this. Yeah. Actually, it was a real deal the first time. <laughs> and poker-wise, it wow. took a while to affect your game? 
Well, I don't know if you've ever done ecstasy. It just, it just enhances whatever mood you're in. Right. So if you happen to be in a dark place, it makes it darker mm. and happy, happier. It, yeah. Actually, Huck told me that. He goes, whatever you do, don't take this to get happy. Take it because you're happy. Okay. But, you know, the uh, ecstasy phase only lasts about a year. Well, obviously, you, you, you've always been candid about your, you know, party days or whatever you want to call them, but... Uh, what's your attitude now towards the whole everything? I think I, I went and traded in. I had a lot of fun, but there's things I wish I would have done different. Obviously, financially, you know, because you, you just you had no respect for money. But now I can't even drink three or four beers without being laid up for a day. So <laughs> I, I hardly drink at all. I don't do anything anymore. Uh, and when you're golfing in Vegas at 110 degrees heat, if you're out there drinking, you're just you're, you don't, you're you don't want to be sweating the no. beer out, Jeez. especially it's miserable. A, uh, obviously, um, uh, you, you said you uh, you had won the second of your back to back titles without getting any sleep in between. Um, what about the years at the series following that? Uh, Do you feel like you were chasing anything at all, or like it was just going to come to you? Like easily, or as far as what be able to play, or well, I'm just saying you have a run like that where you win two bracelets, two bracelets. <laughs> yeah, you, you think you're gonna do it all the time? Exactly. Um, yeah, but that went on for eight, ten years. Mm -hmm. You know, like, I, you know, I, I won so many things that I never. Well, and the other thing is I had Ted Forrest behind me. That's and the beauty of having a, a backer like that is, you, you don't play desperate. You know. You don't play scared money. Yeah. You know, you know you're deep enough. I mean, when I came to town, I didn't I didn't have, you know, online money that we ran up. It was, we, you got to go out and try to earn it. It was a lot harder then. You know, you got to drive down. You got to find a game. And then you got to be on the list. And then when the <laughs> sucker leaves, the game breaks. You got to go somewhere else. Or you got to start the game, and it's a crappy game. Yeah. Then you got to play for two days. It was tough. It was tougher then. Uh, let's move it on here. I heard that you... I want to talk a little bit about basketball <laughs> because I heard that you were basically invited to become like this undercover pro in Michael Jordan's game. Ha! <laughs> you heard that story? <laughs> that is funny. That went... I mean, I don't have all the certainly details. certainly wasn't a basketball game. <laughs> right, it wasn't a basketball game. It was a poker game. You want to hear this story? But this, this is a great story. Michael Jordan was a poker player and you were basically being brought in to take him down or That's something? That's funny. I forgot that story. <laughs> 2000 and. It was either 02 or 03. Now, you know, I was pretty good friends with the Binions. I grew up right outside their ranch in Montana. Okay, cool. That's how we bonded when I came to town. I didn't know him then, but I had delivered papers to old man Benny. Mm -hmm. Stuff, because he's the only white limo to come through this little town of Montana. And uh, so they took me in when they knew I was from Montana, where I was from. It was an automatic bond. So <laughs> I had one back-to-back -back bracelets. <laughs> I get a phone call from Benny Lane. Meet me down in LA. And they always, I always had my own suite at the top. It was the lane suite. <laughs> so I said, all right, let's go. So we went down and we went to the back door of the Crazy Horse. Went back, back in the office. Sets so a couple guys. This is the, the strip club back in the day? Yeah. Sets so a couple guys. And I'm like, Benny, what are we doing? He's like, just, just listen. I said, all right. Lane. <laughs> <laughs> we want to take you to Chicago. <laughs> Put you in this Michael Jordan game, right? A couple of mafia guys, Chicago guys. And, and no pros allowed. <laughs> I says, all right. I says, what am I getting in bed with, right? But I didn't give two. Right, let's go. Yeah. Right? Now I go back. And uh, I had now had one back-to-back -back bracelets. And this never happens, but there it is on ESPN and on David Letterman. Is oh, it? you're outed. Yeah. So <laughs> it was about Michael Jordan after he lost the Wizards in 02. He lost okay. the team. Yeah. It's Michael Jordan, what are you going to do now? Number two was win the World Series of Poker like oh, Lane Flack. Oh, talking about like Letterman's top ten? Yeah. Okay. You know what I mean? Number two was win the World Series of Poker like Lane Flack. Oh. They call me and says, cat's out of the bag, kid. No go. <laughs> <laughs> I, that Looking would have back, been it was something. a blessing, yeah. But that would have been something to be in Michael Jordan's game, just like, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just a little Lane yeah. Flack. <laughs> yeah, I don't even know how it would have happened, but. Yeah, you had a good relationship with Jerry Buss, right? Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. I spent a lot of... I never went to a game. I didn't sit in the box. I spent a lot of time up at his house. He was... He likes to say, he's the one that made me famous. That's his... Oh, yeah? Yeah. 
Oh, because of the Invitational? Mm-hmm. That makes sense. Um, By the way, was it was it Mickey Rooney? No, it was... God, I think it was Mickey Rooney. He's a little short, bald-headed comedian. Mm-hmm. He took seventh. And I, I wanted him and Jerry at the final table. Oh, okay. Because I, I knew it would be a good show. Yeah, of course. Well... Rooney gets in all of his money, and I call him with two fives, trying to pump two sixes, trying to pump him up. He had two fives. <laughs> I did everything I could to not bust Jerry, because I knew it'd be a good show. And then uh, he just stayed out of the way, which was smart. Mm-hmm. I bust everybody else, and we got head up, which was perfect, because it made for the uh, a great show. This is the WPT invitation, yeah. by the way, not a not a real right. event. Right. <laughs> just so people listening aren't like, yeah, hey, that's not a standard play. It was. <laughs> This was like the first one. Everybody was having fun. It was yeah, it celebrity was, invitation. Like right. That. It wasn't really for a ton of money. It was more for a $25,000 seat and 100000 or something. It was $25,000 buy-in, whatever it was. So it wasn't for anything. Of course, the game we played afterwards was... <laughs> yeah, of course. Jimmy and Jerry was 400000 or something. It was going to be a game afterwards. We were course. lit up. Uh, can you talk about uh, life in the fast lane <laughs> and what, what that sure. was supposed to be? Sure. So... I, uh, uh, great, I, great pun, by the way. You like that? Life in the fast lane. Yeah. Just happened to work out. <laughs> I, I, we were headed down to the horseshoe, me and a, a guy at the time who was my manager agent. We headed down there to, to have a meeting, and it, there was a guy down there, production company, trying to do stuff getting into poker. Well, I had suggested three or four things that I thought they should do, and I'm going to give you a suggestion after this, by the way, down there. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, I think, would be a good one for Cool, me. yeah. And uh, and uh, I was going to do it myself, but I don't want to do it. <laughs> and uh, I, I don't know. We just come with a reality show with me, and and somebody said that name, Life in the Fast Lane, and uh, I don't know. We just tried it. So the cameras just followed me around for a while. But you know how hard a B production team is to get here. It just didn't go. The biggest problem I think they had was when we were using the Eagles song. Oh, copyright issues? Yeah. They uh, they came at us. They said, you know, you're going to pay for that. <laughs> <laughs> so how did the, how far did the show get? You shot a pilot and that was about it? Well, they they followed. Let's see. We did some stuff in Denver, in, uh, in Aruba, in Vegas, and one other place. So they had a lot of footage. Mm-hmm. But the guy that was financing a production company, they had a falling out. I mean, I, I don't know. It might have been a su- success. Because <laughs> I was pretty out of control then. I, all gloves were off at all times. We could have had an entertaining Lane Flex uh, story. There. <laughs> I still actually get stopped. Life in the fast lane. That's crazy. So if yeah, I guess somebody look, Googles me, you know, they research it, they'll find it. <laughs> uh, you have a great story about playing in Atlantic City with a guy who refused to move his ashtray. You like that? I love that story. Ah, ignorance. <laughs> Smoke everywhere, and it's disgusting. This guy has an ashtray, and it's full. I'm in seat five, which is already a miserable seat. He's in seat four, and the ashtray is sitting right between us. And he just didn't care. I, I didn't say anything because smoking was okay. When he stopped, I just sat it, sat it back. Mm-hmm. Well, he, he just set it back up. I'm using it. I said, you're, you're not using it right now. I, I sat it down. He put it back up. So I went to the bathroom and took my socks and underwear off and came and set it on the table right next to him. I said, you like it? <laughs> <laughs> they're about as gross they're about as equal well it's going to disgust him yeah but he th- because you can smoke they don't realize it's still disgusting to people who don't mm-hmm. and you know it really know it now with when you go to places that there is no smoking right Huge. exactly you just don't realize how big a difference it really was i remember those early days uh when i started playing poker in florida they didn't have the no smoking and i would just go home with headaches just oh, all day from it and, and some cultures, they just blow it right in your face, and it's a chain smoking. And they don't care. Yeah. You just want to smack them. <laughs> uh, let's, um, you're known for being one of the, the, the quickest people, and uh, I was interested that you brought up a book by Malcolm Gladwell called Blink and yeah. to explain kind of how you have this knack for reading people and going with your gut feeling. Have you read the book? I have, yeah. So it, it, if I remember right, it's about a desk that, is supposed to be an authentic desk, and he's not sure, so he has it looked at by four or five different people. They guarantee that it's real, and then one other guy looks at it and says, it's not. He says, how do you know? He says, I just know. Yeah. And that's what Blink is about. Sometimes you just know. And so I I break it down as your right brain and left brain thinker, right? 
Okay. Well, one side of your brain does a process of eliminations, and the other side of the brain is doing educated guesses. Well, when you narrow it down, sometimes you just know. And it's like when I do the read on TJ, it says it's two jacks. When, when Doyle moved all in on me, I said, you got King Nine? Mm-hmm. And uh, he's like, how'd you know? I says, because you, you shrugged. Because uh, it come 10, 9, 5, and I turn over King 10, he goes, oh, sh-. it had to be King 9. Yeah. You know, that wasn't, that wasn't like, it's not like you're, I'm a master reader. It was, yeah. it, it, it can only be X amount of hands. And sometimes there's just all those little things add up in your brain to just tell you that your gut tells you that's what it is. Right. And you, if you don't go with that read, to, <clears throat> I did a thing with Jeff Matz and he asked me to help him teach. And when I went down to do a, it might have been for, no, it was for the World Series. I don't remember this one. Like an academy kind of thing? Yeah. So I went and helped him. By the time we was done, they offered me a piece of the company. <laughs> they wanted me to do all my own shows because of the way I was teaching. And, and it, was, it was really incredible what I came up with. Because I, I was nervous because I had never done it. So on the plane, I was dead tired. I had to get up at 4 o'clock. I'm half asleep, flying to New Orleans. And I'm going, how are you going to do this? How are you going to do this? <laughs> You're flying there with no plan. And so I came up with what's called the poker language. Okay. And this is great because poker is a game and a conversation going on without words. And I'll, I'll break it down. If I'm going to teach you uh, Spanish or another language or I'm going to teach you poker, somebody raises. That means one of two things. I'm yeah. bluffing, trying to get everybody out, or I have a good hand. Exactly. So he's telling it. This guy re-raises. What's he doing? Telling you, I got you beat, or I'm, you know, this yeah. guy folds. Telling you I have nothing. These are words. Now, I'll teach you the words, which most people already know if they play poker. They, they know what that means. But most of them are oblivious to anything that's going on around them except what's going on with them. So when you teach them to pay attention to the conversation going on without words, their attentive or alertness triples. Yeah. Now they start paying attention to understand why you should. And so what I started doing was putting the cards Right, it's out. like when the small blind folds for only half a bet. That's yeah, and he even doesn't understand the odds. Or, yeah. yeah. I mean, you must have really had a horrible hand. Exactly. So I started doing it where I would make them, nobody fold, and make them bet their hand the way they should with the hands out there. And before they turn the hands over, I had everybody say, who do you think has the winner and what do you think they have? And they tried to guess well, they were amazed when I would tell him exactly what he has. I'd say he probably has second pair with a medium kicker because he was a little cautious. He wasn't sure. Check called. Probably wasn't real strong. Or you know. And I says, he's telling you what he has. He's paying off and he doesn't believe you based on you played every single hand and you played no hands. You know, and you gauge it by that. I gauge people's hand by what position they raised in and how often they have raised. You know, if this guy never raised, he raised under the gun. He's going to be a lot stronger than a guy who raises a lot. And, does it. and then... If you can learn to put those words into sentences and then learn how to create a whole page as a strategy. Yeah. Now you know exactly the end of the story if you follow your strategy in the work. Yeah. So it was really intriguing to him. Yeah, I like the way to, to, to break it down. Like your actions tell a story. Mm-hmm. Most people won't pay attention. what are the language of those actions? They, yeah. they look at their cars, no good, throw it away, and, and they go on about their business. And, and if that's not poker, that's... You go through the yeah, motions. Exactly. Uh, getting back to your bracelets, um, obviously six of them that puts you in elite company. Uh, I always ask, where are your bracelets? Do you display them? I, I read one is gone, but uh, so the first one I got, I had in in my safe. Uh, that was for my daughter. Uh, so over the course of years, you collect jewelry and stuff, people pawn it or whatever. My goal was to take every piece of jewelry and stuff I collected and build it on top of the bracelet to give to her. Well, I, I, I must have been, I was having a tough time and I was depressed and stuff and Helmuth called me and says, get up here to Palo Alto. So I got on a plane when I came home, my house was robbed and uh, they took this whole safe. So Ugh. And it was only the one bracelet. The second bracelet I gave to my brother. Third bracelet I gave to my other brother. Fourth bracelet I gave to my father. The fifth bracelet Ted Forrest lost. <laughs> How did Ted Forrest lose a bracelet? I, I, I don't know. I had it. I, when I won it, I went out partying that night, and he was going home. I gave it to him to take home, and he has no clue where it is. <laughs> I, but I actually found it. Okay. Uh, eight, six, seven, eight years later, another guy that's living in the house said, by the way, I have your bracelet. 
<laughs> it I was, was like, in, it was intense couch cushions. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I appreciate you telling me seven years later. <laughs> and my sixth one I have at my house to get back to my daughter. And then this is even the worst thing ever, and I, I'm just distraught about this. A good friend of mine, your competitor, mm-hmm. you know who it is? What? There's so many. Casey Thompson. <laughs> okay. Has a deal with online gaming and the Indian tribes in California. On the board is two chair women, and they're possessed. They're oh, possessed the wrong word there. What, what am I? Obsessed? Obsessed. With wanting two bracelets. Casey calls me and says, can I borrow two bracelets? I says, can you borrow two bracelets? <laughs> I still haven't got them back. So, and then that deal with the tribe fell through. I says, do you mind if we try to get them back now? <laughs> I says, or is that Indian giving? Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, whatever. I Tri- says, tribal giving. <laughs> yeah. So he had offered me a pretty sweet situation in this company that no longer went, and I'm out the bracelets. So. Wow. <laughs> you think you could get those back, huh? Well, don't worry. I reached out to the CEOs of that place, and <laughs> all he did was call Casey, and Casey, ew, he's, I don't know. I just, I just finally let it go. We had a pretty big falling out over it, but we reconciled. Uh, you, I think it's fair to call you a poker personality. I think a lot of the people. I think people, that's fair. I think a lot <laughs> of the people from, from your era, you know, were, were a little bit better about that. Um than some of the, you know, crushers today. What do you mean better about that? Oh, just as far as like having, having an image yeah. uh, to present to the public, whereas that's not as important. That's a Phil Ivey syndrome. Okay, what do you what do you mean by that? Well, if you notice, for a long time, everybody started letting their mouth hang open <laughs> and moving slow because they seen Phil do it, and they all try to emulate. And now it's oh, so you think the you know. No talking, very quiet, mysterious thing. Is everyone trying to copy Ivy? Well, when poker, in my opinion, comes out on TV, when you're at the final table, it's less personality. Everybody's yeah. more serious. And then and then what they've, you know, Phil's obviously a, opposite of me. He's dead quiet. And, I, mean, I mean, I don't know. That's probably part of it. I'm sure that's not the whole thing. But that's just, that's just the way they are. But... Maybe it's because they all play online and they're scared to give tells. And they think the players that didn't play online will read them so easily because that's what they do. That maybe uh, it could right, be but, when, of it. but during the poker boom, when you found yourself on TV, was there, any, was there that thought in the back of your mind like, hey, people are watching this. We have a duty to entertain. Oh, I pissed so many people off. <laughs> uh, it's unbelievable. They barred me from the World Series final tables at one time. <laughs> well, I was the biggest name for Three or four years, Phil was too, because he was winning a yeah, lot of yeah. races right at the time I was. And I remember I was at the final, not the final table, but the stage table, whatever it's called, it's feature table, at the World Series. And they said, okay, we're changing the feature table. Everybody take your mics off except you, Lane. We'll bring you eight more players. <laughs> and my mic's on, and I make a comment that says, these people realize this is how I make my money? I just figured these players out, and they take them away? Not realizing the value of, of maybe the notoriety of TV and stuff. Yeah. And they said, well, fine. We won't put Lane on TV anymore. I didn't even realize my mic was on. Everybody was listening. Wow. So I ended up taking the whole crew to to, uh, to the Palms nightclub. To, to no, no, it. we're all good, boys. We're all Sorry. good. I, uh... <laughs> was, that, I invited everybody was, that, was that Maury's guys? Ah, oh, dude, it was so long ago. God. <laughs> that, that, that's what? Oh, four or five. Was, I don't remember who all it was. Uh, can we talk about the Hall of Fame a little bit? Shh. Uh, just, the Hall of Fame tournament or no, the inductee? No, the, you know, the Poker yeah. Hall of Fame. You know, right. it, it, it stands to reason, given your, your resume and accomplishments, that you should be in the Hall of Fame one day. I agree. Um, but there are people being nominated ahead of you that are lesser. I agree. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Probably has to do with Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> Get your head on straight, boy. Um, you think this is right. politics? I mean, Daniel and uh, and Doyle have a lot of say in that, but I have actually never even tried to nominate. I I, <clears throat> I know I'll be in the Hall of Fame. I, of course, I'd like to be alive when I yeah get in, and I know it's going to be harder and harder ten years from now because 
the younger generation of superstars will be 40 years old then? Yeah, I think I think there's going to be a push to maybe bump up the number to three or four uh, eventually, Probably. just because there's going to be a log jam. You know, once the online kids turn 40 and they start, you know, anybody who's still around and mm-hmm. they'll have 20 million in earnings the, by then. The, the problem they're doing is they're getting off track just a hair because the three or four things that are requirements to be in the Hall of Fame, people are getting inducted that don't qualify. And it's and it, that's wrong. You, you know, you have to be an established high limit player. There's people inducted. I've never played high limit. Yeah. You know, and you got to have the accolades. You have to be an ambassador. You have to be, you know, liked or whatever. And obviously, I qualify for all that. Yeah. Um, I've never said, got out there and tried to promote to to do it. Actually, I did last year. I think it was. I said, I told Ivy, let's do this. He said, I forgot he had just turned 40. He says, whatever you want. Like, <laughs> 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 and I, I really, and then I realized it, it's probably his turn. Yeah, it's probably his turn. What, what I think would be a, gr- a, a good one by the way, would be Lane and Ted Forrest. Oh, like as a, as a duo? Would be a, a two great, uh, or good ones, uh, maybe not great. We're close friends. He staked me forever. We're side by side. He's got all the accolades. Obviously one of the biggest ambassadors and high limit players and all around great people there is. So, you know, that would be, that would be good, I think. But well, you see people like Mike are campaigning actively, and you're just like, Mike, you know, Madison. get in line, you know. <laughs> like, I know Mike Madison believes he, he should, and he probably should be. <clears throat> I mean, he's been around just as long. I mean, he doesn't have as many bracelets, but he's, he, you know, he's done everything required. Yeah. So you think he'll get in, it's just a matter of... I can't. Why? I mean, why, why would I not? Yeah. I mean, even if it's 20 years from now, I mean, it's... <laughs> a matter of, of if uh, a matter of when not if I mean if I push it <clears throat> maybe it'll happen I don't know I'm not I, I'm just not a guy that cares as much about what people think A or needing all the notoriety I, I don't need the spotlight I'm just not that guy but I'm an A personality and when I'm at the table you're going to know I'm sitting there but it's all in fun this is a saying that I get all the time. Every time I'm done playing a table at the World Series anywhere, everybody gets up and says, that's the most fun I've ever had at a table. Yeah. So the more I play, I just gain fans. They just, because I am fun. And I don't take it serious. Well, but I am serious. I was talking to somebody. They told me there's two types of people. The, the type of person who wants everybody to come to their birthday party and the type of person who likes to go to a birthday party and have everyone look at them instead of the birthday person. You know what I mean? Like that has to fall under women, not men. Well, I'm just saying, like <laughs> there are people who like the spotlight, but they want to earn it. You know what I mean? Right. As opposed to just like throw, throw it on me, throw it on me. You know. Well, in this situation, I think both apply. I mean, I'm I'm sure I've earned it. Mm-hmm. Um, but and, Sorry, I, not, and not I do earn want it, it. Ask for it. I right. should say, yeah. Right. I I won't go out of my way. I you're right. I would rather people want me to do it than me beg to do it for sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, we end the podcast with some rapid fire questions if you're ready to go. Okay. Uh, big... I'm not very quick, so. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> my, <laughs> my questions are, are rapid. Your answers can be slow. Well, I heard <laughs> I was pretty quick, but. Uh, biggest pot you've ever won or lost? Uh, cash. Your choice. I mean, you played pretty high in, in some of the yeah, big games. Yeah, I was trying huh? to think. My biggest no limit pot was probably 250000 uh, and the Larry Flint game was probably 200000 uh, playing 2,000, 4,000. Can you get that big? 50 bet now, probably 140,000. And that one, some no limit pots. This is playing mixed Oh, I took or? that back. Some of my PLO pots, I won't, oh my God. I was playing in a private game in Dallas. Four way pot. Everybody flopped a rap. <laughs> and it came out with a jack on board, jack, jack. Right? Everybody flopped a rap. This pot is 290,000. I win it with ace nine high. Because wow. everyone missed. Oh, right. And you had blockers. It ran out jack-jack, <laughs> so there's three jacks on board. Yeah. Wow. And I had, like, the, I had like the nine, queen, ten, whatever yeah, it was yeah. that made the wrap and an ace. Oh, not the queen, because ace nine won it, but take it. <laughs> that was a big one. Oh, I guess it wasn't that rapid. But right, was, cool. uh, what about uh, a lost one? Or any that were, like, they still sting that you still think about? I remember one time I was playing a 400, 800 game, and Daniel was in the game, too. The river came a nine. So Ace King made a straight and no low got there. I had Ace do seven, eight. Somebody bet, somebody called. I was so pissed because I'd been getting crushed. 
And I took the card and I threw it at the bottom in the straight. Is that one in the spot is enormous? I said, hold on, hold on, hold on. Here we go. My cards were... You'd crumbled them up. Oh, yeah, threw it. They still speak, even if they're a little bent. Yeah. I mean, I didn't pull them out of my pocket cooking, boys. These are the... Yeah. <laughs> oh, I was, I was upset. Uh, what about biggest pie you've ever witnessed? Oh. Uh, well, it's they, they were in private games, in in Parliament, Omaha, private games. Any, uh, any, yeah, uh, I mean, I've I've seen many half a million dollar pots. Yeah. Uh, best swap or piece you've ever had of anybody? Doyle Brunson. This is great. Yeah. So I, back when I was boom boom, you know, knocking everything out. Only I only I only traded with two people: Doyle Brunson and Johnny Chan. Five percent of piece. Wow, that's a pretty good company. Yeah, and so, <laughs> so uh, we're at the Bellagio or at the Bicycle Club when you want. Mm-hmm. We're going into day two, and I'm out. And I said, Doyle comes walking by. I said, Doyle, what do I got to do to get a piece? He says, throw me a quarter chip. Throw him a quarter chip. He says, you got 1%. Oh, that's <laughs> he all. Me, he handed me eleven or 12000 <laughs> <laughs> That's got to be nice. Yeah. Nice little gift from, from uh, Doyle there. Now, I had 2% of Tex Barch when he took third for Oh, in the main. Million, yeah. Nice. That'll work. I always have nice uh, having a piece of the main. And I, uh, I always have like 3% of Scotty Went. And I had a third of Scotty in, in when he won the 50K. I, oh, okay. I put up 25000 for that. I've, I've staked Scotty for three of his bracelets. What, did you also have a piece along with Mike of his main event one? Mm-hmm. I didn't even know him. I just got to town. Oh, I, okay. Yeah. I didn't really know him. Yeah, because I, I was t- who was I talking to about Scotty? And they were saying, like, yeah, that guy, <laughs> he, he was pieced out for a while to a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Um, but he... he well, let's not. I don't, go ahead. Don't <laughs> it's all good. Yeah. Weirdest place you've ever played poker for money? <clears throat> you mentioned some private games. I mean, in Montana, they used to have poker games in strip clubs, and and, oh. and you stood up to play. <laughs> so you you would come in and be like seven people standing at a table, like it was blackjack or something, and. Uh, so that was probably pretty ridiculous. <laughs> a little distracting, maybe. <laughs> not in Montana. You'd rather watch a card. <laughs> <laughs> uh, who's the best player we've never heard of? Never heard of. Somebody maybe back in the day or today that just doesn't get their their due. Oh, my. God, I I don't know. I'm sorry. I, I, don't, I don't know. It's all good. Who? I mean, I know who I think is the best. What do you mean? I mean, I know who I think is better than everybody. The best player in the world right now? Uh, I, I, there's uh, there's somebody Shout, I think has always been better than everybody. Shout him out. John Hennigan. John Hennigan is the world beater, huh? He's got more talent in one finger than most people will ever have in poker in a lifetime. The man is good. I got to get him on this podcast. Uh, I was trying to reach out to Nick about getting that. Oh, uh, I can get him. Yeah, the 50K winner himself, um, John Johnny World. Mm-hmm. That's a, that, that, that guy's definitely been on top for a while. Yeah. I mean, when I met him over in Atlantic City, he was friends with Ted Forrest, and Ted Forrest started staking me, and he didn't, John didn't know who I was. He goes, I got to meet this guy. I got to meet this guy, you know, because they thought I was taking advantage of Ted. <laughs> now we're all out partying or something. John says to me, first question he says, if Ted hands you 100000 to go play crafts, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to take the 100000 and when Ted wakes up, there's going to be 100000 sitting next to him. He goes, <laughs> because I'm not going to go play, but I'm, yeah. I'll take the money because whatever. I, you I know, like the way you, you answered that question, though. So, so John goes straight to Ted and says, if you gave Lane 100000 to go play crafts, what's he going to do? He says, probably put it in his pocket and tell me tomorrow. <laughs> John says, good enough for me. <laughs> there you go. There so, you go. No. Uh, who's the best human being you've ever met in the poker world? So uh, take poker skill out of it. Mm-hmm. Could just be a good friend or... <laughs> I mean, there's a person I'm hanging around with a lot right now. It's Scott Clemens. I think he's a wonderful person. Uh Scott Clemens is still one of the answers I get for nicest guy in poker, you know what I mean? Yeah. He, Scott is extremely reserved and to himself and he's never you know, he he never gets upset. He does inside, but and he never he never says anything to anybody or whatever. He, he takes his licks like a man. And he's honest. And in the in, in the poker industry and stuff, there's just so many bad people and so many liars and I I like to think of myself as an extremely honest person. And and same with John Hennigan. In fact, me, we've had this talk. He says it's a sure is a lot less stuff to have to remember, isn't it? <laughs> By telling yeah. the truth. When people lie, you have to remember all the lies. 
to be able to. You know, and you know, reputation is everything in poker. Yeah, it's, but what people don't realize is if you just tell the truth and own it, your reputation is going to be way better because people are going to know. Yeah, and people always think that you know they're getting away with it, and they're just not. People just don't care. Yeah, you know, like if you lie to me, I don't care, so I'm not going to say anything. But I'll know. Oh, it's a, it's just like uh, Chino Reem, you know, the, the yeah. notorious Chino Reem, you know. His stuff is all out in the open, and people seem to respect that more than the guy who's doing the Chino thing, in, un, you know, under the guise of Big Winner who... They you don't know. respect it. Well, I mean, it's better than hiding it. What, what, what they do is, now they know, by being honest, they know now that they won't get in that position with mm -hmm. him. And all the people that know that he did that, they won't get in bed with him with anything. But the fact that he told the truth is, well, at least, yeah, you did that yeah. because everybody's going to know. Chino's a beauty. He borrowed 2000 and he went 750000 while there. I still didn't get my 2000 right? <laughs> and then me and him hit the final table at Winstar. Oh, he did it again. He busted off his money and he calls me to borrow it. I says, 8000 or something. I says, you won 750000 I couldn't get my 2000 How much you got to win if I give you 8000 <laughs> <laughs> I says, what, are you going to win $50 million? Yeah. <laughs> I said, no, Chino. <laughs> Oh, man. Uh, worst job before poker? My first job ever was at McDonald's. You worked at McDonald's, huh? They, I lived in Sturgis, South Dakota. It was a town of 5,000, and they built a new McDonald's. So I was junior in high school. Everybody tried to work. I made it two weeks. Yeah? Cool. Oh, yeah. You were working fries? or You take that You take that, that gun that they squirt, I don't know, a thousand island sauce and stuff. The condiments, yeah. And everybody's trying to learn their position, and so, so they're making some people boss. Well, I had a boss that just went and shut up. I just took that gun and just ghosted him. <laughs> I said, now leave me alone. Well, I lost that job. <clears throat> Which was good because I was going to sleep seeing burgers, and I, uh, I didn't like it. So uh, I didn't make it long. If not for poker, what would you be doing? You know, as a professional bowler. Wow, you're the, you'd be the third professional bowler we've had on here, apparently. Oh, yeah? The Jack McCullen and Matt Savage apparently both played professionally for a brief time. Matt won't bowl me. Matt won't bowl you, huh? No. God. <laughs> I put I put it out there. I, I bowled one person, David Plastic. I was offering to bet people I'd play him $100 a pin. Mm -hmm. David Plastic decided he's going to man up. So we played for $20 a pin. First game, he owed me $2,000. Oh, looked. my God. He shot a 166. I shot a 266. And I've been a ball three years. Wow. So We're using a lane ball? No, no. I went and drilled one out. Oh, you, you got a real one. Out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was trying to make a pun with your name, but it's okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, just, don't give me any flack about the lanes. How's that? Exactly. I them all. <laughs> um, what was your largest non-poker wager? 250000 I bet Ted Forrest, this guy could run a six-minute mile. That he could? Yep. Okay. Who was this guy, and what, what was the details of this? He was a friend of mine from Montana, and... I had ran with him, and he could do it, and he and he did it numerous times, like on a on a on a machine. Uh, and he cramped up on the first lap. Oh, it was me, him, and Huck out there. Huck's a notorious runner, and he tried to he tried to get another fifty or hundred thousand down with me. I said, "That's enough." I lost a hundred thousand. I lost another hundred thousand to Ted in a bowling game. We were completely out of it. I, I can't remember what we were on. <laughs> you spotted him a couple uh, too many. No, how do you like this? In the seventh frame, he only had like 40 points. He, <laughs> he had to mark the last three frames. He didn't even know how much the ball weighed. That he was, he, he's like, he, like it was, I think it was, I don't know what we were doing, special K or something. <laughs> oh, man, this is a disaster. He beat me, I think he bowled like a 102 or something, just barely got there. <laughs> uh, what is a talent you don't have that you wish you did? Only a few more questions left, I promise. God, these are good questions. Well, you know, 60, sep 60 episodes in, I hope I have nailed them down by now. The beauty is, oh, I, maybe I'm just happy with myself. <laughs> I don't know what more I need. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, it's not a talent. I, I wish, I really do wish I, I could keep my cool more. You know how okay. you, you, you get hot-headed and then you think afterwards? Mm -hmm. I wish I could reverse that. <laughs> but yeah. I wish I could think and then react as a pulls automatic reactive. Ah, when do does that? this happen? Like uh, in traffic or? Uh... <laughs> you mean, I don't get too mad in traffic. Now, I don't know what it is. When people do stupid shit, it drives me nuts. Not when people 
do things wrong. When people intentionally do stupid shit, I blow a gasket. Yeah. Or when people are belittling other people at the table and stuff, or when people are disrespecting other people, I step in. I Every have noticed time. that you're pretty much uh, uh, one of the top Mediator. white knights of the, oh, yeah. of the poker table. You ask any poker dealer, I, I'm their favorite. Yeah, I, I, I defend and protect everybody in that sense. If this guy is picking on this guy, I will step in mm-hmm. because it's, it's bullshit. You know, it's, it's, buddy, if you think you're that tough, let's go. Yeah, and you know I really don't care. How many fights have you got at the table? <laughs> no, at a table, not too often. They, they, every, every single person's backed off. Okay. Now I have one outside with three or four people, but they backed off right when we because they didn't think I'd go. Any of them notable poker players that we would know? Y- yeah. Does that mean you're not gonna answer? No. Because <laughs> um, I know Phil's been in some fist fights that have been famous. I was there. <laughs> oh, the one with Grizzle. Oh yeah. So that one went like this, you know. So Grizzle is walking around. He's always walking around with a towel like this. It looks like he's got Parkinson's in his right hand. So he goes out there and says, Phil, watch out with that right hand, right? <laughs> Phil not looking. Boom. <laughs> I, I don't think Phil thought Sam would hit him. Yeah. Uh, well, clearly. Uh, yeah. Sam had to reach on that one. Uh, uh, yeah. I've, I've gotten in some I knew I'd lose to. I, I knew I was going to lose. But I, was, I said, listen, we do it different where I'm from. You want to go outside? I says, we ain't going to make it to the door. <laughs> Win or lose, we're going. <laughs> but I don't get too old. Uh, headphones on at the table, yes or no? Nah. I talk too much. I, I like it's once in a great while if I'm just in that mood, but not too often. Or if I, I like to hear somebody's at the table. I like to hear everything that's going on. Uh, what kind of music do you listen to? 80s. <laughs> 80s? Yeah. What's your favorite 80s, album? 80s, 90s, I guess. My favorite album? God, I know what this is too, but I'm I'm blanking. Who's the artist? It it varies. Uh, here's what I do: I I'll buy a CD and I'll burn it out till I can't listen to it anymore. Oh, you're one of you just repeat, repeat, yeah, like repeat. Like I put Kings of Leon on for two weeks and then I can't take it anymore. No. I uh, who, who, I can't even say what I'm trying to say. But who whoever Akon, I'll put him in for two three weeks and then. But I just listen to the radio, whatever's on. So I, I'm not picky. On music. What about favorite movie? Simple. The movie Simple? No. <laughs> Everybody, say, everybody's favorite movie. What is it? Uh, you know you're saying Rounders? Tombstone. Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought you were going to get to a poker thing. Tombstone. Okay. Tombstone. If Tombstone, I've watched Tombstone close to 200 times. If it's on, I will watch it. Yeah, what, what's, what's the appeal? I don't know. I, I got a drawing. I had an artist draw a big thing of... of, of Doc Holliday is hands yeah. in my house. Next to Marilyn Monroe, me, my daughter, and I call it the Hall of Fame. <laughs> Wall of Fame. The Wall of Fame. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, that's that's awesome. Yeah, like I, I remember the the quote from that movie. I got two guns or whatever. No. He, he says, uh, you're two drunk to me. He says, he says, he says there's, you know, there's two of me. He says, well, I got a gun for the both of you. <laughs> that's right, right. I got one for each of you. Yeah, yeah, that's what each, yeah. Uh, we end the podcast the same way every time. You want me to sing? Oh yes! I thought you, you're gonna, you were gonna get your uh, your your singing in there. No, it's a, the question from the random question generator. Okay. So who knows what this is gonna be? Yeah, I don't think this is. Is this random? Really random? Yeah, I have okay. a page up. All right. Uh, well, it, it, there is a list of twenty. All right. If it's stupid one, I'll just pick out. Do you want to pick a number one through twenty? Because there's twenty up here. Just pick any number one through twenty, and I'll give All you right, that. Thirteen. One. Thirteen. Have you ever been tanning? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You always look pretty tan. Well, that's from golf. But not only have I been tanning, I, I'll spray tan this Neutrogena stuff or whatever at the house. Because you want to get that, that, that skin. No, I'm no, working here. No, no. If it's winter <laughs> and you've got to go do something on TV or something, you just spray it and, you, and oh. then you're not pale white. Or if, say, you're, you're, you're I'm in Montana or something, I'm going to go to Vegas or going to go down to the Caribbean or something. You you got to go tan a couple times. Yeah, you don't want to show up right. there and burn yourself. Pale white and fry yourself. Yeah, yeah. that's the only reason I've tanned. What about other uh, beaut- beautification processes? Are you a, a manicure guy? Uh, oh yeah, I'll do mani pedis. Yeah. Oh yeah. Because about to say like poker players aren't shy about taking care of themselves. But I got sugar scrubs, salt scrubs. <laughs> I, I'll pamper myself. Yeah. And I enjoy it. Well, I mean, you should. That's the that's, way to go. That's why I don't look fifty. Yeah, of course not. Of course not. <laughs> oh, it's, by the way, you just tur- you're about to turn. Yeah, what, what 18th, is it? Eighteenth. So. I'll play the seniors this year. You're about to fit. You're about to play the seniors. About no. to say. No. How do you feel about that? I'm ready. This is this is this is an odd answer. Barry Greenstein was playing in a tournament. I said Barry, why are you, why are you playing this? The seniors over there. Mm-hmm. And 
Every year, I go walking through all the seniors and shake their hands. And then I'll put out a tweet that says, this is why we're here without these guys. Girls, and I'll pay my respects. This year, I will be that guy. Yeah. And I said, Barry, why don't you play? He says, I, I don't feel I need to play the seniors until I'm not good enough to compete with you guys. I said, so you're saying they're no good? Mm. I said, Barry, that's unorthodox. That's not like you. That's kind of like the Tiger Woods approach. Yeah, like, like you, Tiger's going to turn 50, and you know he's not going to go on the Champions Tour and just no, destroy. No, no. You know, he's going to keep trying to play with the young guys. But you, you will agree, 50 today is not 50 of 30 years ago. Of course, yeah. You know, a 50-year-old, you know, 30 years ago looked 50. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's some there's some decent names that, you know, go deep in that event every sure. year. And it's a huge event, and there's obviously value. Why wouldn't you play it? That's right. It's a thousand dollar tournament with one reentry, I think, this year, and versus seven hundred and fifty. It pays more than most all the other tournaments. <laughs> exactly. I mean, oh, card player zone. Alan Showman won it for about six hundred and eighty grand. Uh, that's right. A few years back. Uh, anyway, Lane, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you so much for the stories. You're welcome. Hope uh, I didn't keep you too long. That's it. That's the show. Thank you once again to the always entertaining Lane Flack. Uh, there have been a handful of episodes we've done that I believe have warranted a part two, and maybe we'll start doing that with some of our more prolific poker storytellers. Maybe that's a good idea for bonus episodes. Who knows? I'm just thinking out loud here. Anyway, you can follow Lane on Twitter at Back to Back Flack. That's two as in the number two. And while you're there, you know, maybe tweet a little support for Lane for consideration in the Poker Hall of Fame. I mean, the guy is top 10 all-time in bracelets and has been eligible for almost a decade, and he can't even get a nomination? I don't know. I don't know. There's a lot of uh, deserving nominees every year, but that that seems off to me. Anyway, you can also follow Card Player on Twitter, at Card Player Media, and even our podcast has its own account, at Poker underscore Stories. If you like this episode, please subscribe. Also, if you haven't already done so, go ahead and leave us a nice rating. It's down there at the bottom of your podcast app. Just click five stars and that will help us spread the word about this podcast. If you leave us a nice review on top of that, let us know about it with an email to pokerstories at cardplayer.com and we'll hook you up with a free digital subscription to Card Player Magazine. Again, rating plus review plus email equals poker magazine. Good deal. Until next time, thanks for listening.